From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Western Union, Mr. Dollar. Message for you from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, go ahead. Received your air special regarding investigation of the Chesapeake matter. You've proved Frank Bowers of Denver is not John Ridden of Baltimore. Fingerprints don't lie, therefore logical to believe John Ridden really dead. Come on home, your expenses are running too high. That's signed Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Or should I mail this to you? No, that's all right. Can I send an answer? Yes, sir. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. Fingerprints don't lie, but people do. All the time. For all sorts of reasons. It may be finished as far as you're concerned, but I'm just beginning. Love, Johnny. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. I'd set out to prove that John Reardon had not died back in 1950 in a boat accident on Chesapeake Bay. To prove that he was still very much alive in the person of one Frank Bowers, currently living here in Denver, Colorado. Everything, all I could learn of the man's history, reports from his neighbors, friends, even his fingerprints, everything indicated he really was Frank Bowers. And yet, for some fool reason or other, I wasn't convinced. Expense account continued. Item 10, 63 bucks for one overcoat. Denver can be a very cold city when the wind comes in from the north and it decides to snow. Almost as cold as the damp wind off Chesapeake Bay on a certain day back in 1950. Hi. Hiya, George. How's it going? Well, I washed Bowers' house from six last night till two this morning. He read a book last night in the living room. He made a phone call, and then he went to bed. And then I went home and went to bed. How many men have you got working? Two others beside myself. We're keeping an eye on Bowers around the clock. I go on again at six. Okay, good. I don't know why, Johnny. He isn't your guy, and you know it. Fingerprints proved it. We can watch him from now till doomsday, and nothing's going to change that. Oh, look, don't you start, Georgie. Huh? I got a wire from my home office this morning telling me to close it up and come on home. Why don't you close it up and come on home? I like to make dough. I'm in the private detective business, but I hate to see an old pal doing a lot of work on nothing. Why don't you shut up? Sure. We can go on like this forever, can't we, Johnny? Ah... Goodbye, Johnny. I walked around the streets of Denver trying to enjoy the sights. But mostly, I wasn't enjoying anything. I was thinking about the whole case from beginning to end. And my only reason for hanging on and being stubborn about it was the fact that Frank Bowers had been too anxious to cooperate. Too anxious to help me prove so easily that he was not John Reardon. And then something else happened. He got anxious once more. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, this is Frank Bowers. Oh, hello. He didn't tell me where you were stopping. Phoned everywhere in town. <laughs> Wondered how you made out. Made out? Yeah, with my fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they don't match at all. Oh, then I'm not your man. Guess not, Mr. Bowers. Well, I was just curious. Didn't hear from you after you took the sample of my prints. Well, that was pretty nice of you to help me out. Uh, how can I thank you? Buy me a drink if you want to. Hey, you're on. All right, meet you at six at the ship's tavern. It was the voice of a confident man again. An overconfident man. The kind who sandbags in a poker game. Who knows about a boat ride and a horse race. And so help me, I knew I was right about him. Expense account, item 11, $14. Booze. For Frank Bowers and myself in the ship's tavern. The same bar, incidentally, where a week before, a close friend of the deceased John Reardon had run into Bowers and sworn he was John Reardon. When Bowers came in, he was followed by George Hanley, as per my instructions. 
I saw George pick a stool at the far end of the bar. Well, I suppose you'll be packing up and leaving the old Mile High City pretty quick now, huh? Did I say that, Frank? No, no, but I just suppose it. You will, won't you? Oh, I haven't decided yet. What do you think I should do? Huh? I said, what do you think I should do? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, maybe I'm just kidding myself. But you don't seem like the kind of fella you should be somehow. No, I don't. Huh? No. Now, you were too nice about answering questions when I came out to your house the other day. Too nice about letting me fingerprint you so I could compare the samples with John Reardon's prints. Too nice about calling up and asking how it all came out. Came out bad, thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty nice fella. <laughs> yeah, that's what the book says. <laughs> uh, what book? I had a private detective friend make one up on you before I even got here. Friends, enemies, money, and whatnot. All very nice. Mm, of course it is. You know what your trouble is, Dolly? You, you don't trust anybody. I'm a nice fella, and you don't trust me. You don't believe what you see. I believe the fingerprints don't match, if that's what you mean. You're the bird I don't believe. Hey, should I get sore? If you want to. <laughs> I'm not gonna. You know why? Because I'm a nice fella. Sure you are. But you ought to get mad when a man calls you a liar. Oh, you didn't call me a liar. I meant to. You're a liar. You know what? I'm not a nice fella all the time. I'd kind of like to hit you in the face or something right now. You're kneeling. Am I? Uh-huh. I think I better call up a girl I know, see what she's doing for dinner. Well, see if she's got a friend. No, no, you're too nasty, friend. You sit tight. Order me a drink. I'll be back in a jiffy. He's a little drunk. Sure he is, George. He's also worried. Any particular reason for getting him that way, Johnny? Yes, he's using the booth in the lobby. Scoot out there and see if you can get a line on who he might be calling. Right. A long ten minutes later, Frank Bowers came back to the bar. He was weaving a little when he got on the stool next to me. George Hanley followed him back inside and took his place at the end of the bar again. Uh, she's busy. Took her a long time to tell you that. She's a girl who takes a long time with everything. Oh, what's her name? Ma? Huh? What's her name? The girl you just called. Oh, Rita. Rita. Well, here's to Rita. Come on, drink up. You might have to eat with me. I don't want to drink to Rita, and I don't want to have dinner with you. What do you think of that? Huh? I thought you were a nice fella, remember? God of blazes. Hold on. Hey! You may have something with this bird at that. How come, George? That call he just made, long distance to Baltimore. I got that much. He said he'd never been there. Didn't know anyone there. Keep an eye on us, Georgie. You betcha, pal. Hey. Hey, Frank. Hey, hey, look. What's the matter, friend? I just left you. I thought for good. Oh, come on. I'll buy you dinner. You buy me nothing, Dollar. Go on back to Baltimore. Why don't you? What? Why don't you go back to Baltimore? What's that supposed to mean? Just what it means. Well? Uh, maybe we better talk some more. Fine, huh? fine. My car is in a lot here. Okay. You're after me, aren't you? Well, let's say I met you yesterday to get some facts. Let's say I drank with you tonight to find out what kind of a guy you are. I've done most of the talking up to date. Now it's your turn. Uh huh. Well? I don't know whether I got anything to say to you. Oh, make up your mind, will you? Look, suppose I were John Ridden. I'm not. But suppose I were. I can't tell you what a court would do about an insurance fraud. No. No, you're just a clumsy ox stumbling around for some answers and you haven't got any yet. Get out of my way. Wait, wait a minute. Wait. Hey. Oh. Oh. He's a very handy fella. I didn't want to interfere, Johnny. Stay on him. See where he goes, what he does, Georgie. Hurry. You all right, pal? Sure. Hurry. I wasn't all right at all. Frank Bowers was not only big but fast, and he caught me off guard. I went back through the hotel lobby up to my room and lay down on the bed, and I waited for the phone to ring. 
Sooner or later, it'd be George Hanley or Frank Bauer's tale reporting some development that had solved the whole case. But the phone didn't ring. Nothing happened. No one phoned. No one came by. I went to sleep about one o'clock. The next morning, George Hanley called and asked me how I was feeling after the punching session in the parking lot. He reported that Frank Bowers had jumped in his car, driven straight home, and gone straight to bed. Expense account item 12, 48 cents, postage. Cost of mailing a sample of Bowers' fingerprints to Washington, D.C. At 8 o'clock that night, I had another phone call. Hi, baby. This is George Hanley. How do you feel? Okay. What's up, Georgie? I'm still keeping my eye on Frank Bowers. He's nervous, all right. Been staying in the house all day. I can see him walking back and forth in the living room. He must have smoked a package of cigarettes every hour. Uh Uh-huh. Has he used the phone? Yeah, yeah. Looks like long-distance stuff again. You know, place the call, hang up, then wait for the operator to call back. Hmm. Possibly Baltimore again. Possible. How about it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Where are you? Right across the street from his house. Be right out. The heater in my rented car wasn't working that night. I remember that part very well. My feet and hands were numb with the ten below weather when I flicked off the lights and pulled up alongside George Hanley, stationed across the street from Frank Bowers' home. Uh, it's some weather. Yeah. How's Bower doing? I think he's got a visitor with him now, Johnny. Must have showed up while I was calling you. Big guy wrapped in an overcoat. I've seen him move around the room a couple of times. George, let's go in and shake him up. I'm tired of all this. You think he's reared? I don't know, but I want to wind it up one way or the other. Okay. You want to wait for his friend to leave? Nope. Oh, it's a nutty thing. You're the one who's nutty. You already proved he isn't John Reardon. That's all you wanted. I know, I know. Now I want to prove I'm getting old and crotchety and don't believe what I see in here. Bear with me, Georgie. Sure, pal. You're crazy, but I love you. Hey. Huh? Visitor's leaving. Make him? No. An overcoat and a hat aren't much to go on. He's... Georgie, come on! Hey, Johnny, look out! down, the gun of the man in the overcoat had gone off a couple more times. The nearest bullet came six inches from the Without my gun, all I could do was hug the ground for cover and try to stay out of his line of fire. The shot deafened me for a moment. When my hearing came back, I heard someone very close to me. It was Georgie. He was dying. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proof that an insurance case is one thing, murder of a pal is something else. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>